It's wordy, I know, but the sermon in the sentence, the big picture, the topic sentence says, in John chapter 8, verses 19 and 20, Jesus responds to the Pharisees' misguided question about his father, emphasizing a profound and transformative knowing relationship. Misguided question, profound and transformative knowing relationship. Let's look at the first phrase. Uh, The Pharisees asking, uh, not who's your daddy, but where's your father? That's uh, John chapter 8, verse 19. Where is your father? Um, In Jewish culture, in Jesus' day and time, it was wisdom to ask the right question. We put the emphasis on knowing the answer. It's all about knowing the answer. In Eastern culture, in Eastern Hebrew culture, it was about asking the right question. If you ask the right question, that was a sign of intelligence and wisdom and brightness. Here, the Pharisees fail. I'm sorry, there is such a thing as a stupid question. I've taught in a university classroom for 16 years and I know there are stupid questions because you spend 20 minutes explaining the answer to something and somebody asks well what does that mean I just spent 20 minutes right and so here you have the Pharisees oh you want your father in heaven to give testimony to you where is he bring him forward they the Pharisees are a wonderful bad example I learn from bad examples. I learn from bad examples better than I learn from good examples. So thank you for the self-righteous Pharisees who aren't seeking truth, but are just trying to prove their own point and protect themselves. They have, they have bad motivation, a bad attitude that then results in a wrong question from a wrong motive. It reminds me of the idea that When you ask a question, you reveal more about yourself than you do the person you are asking the question. And here we have the self-righteous Pharisees playing from the same game book of utter failure when dealing with Jesus, and that is they are constantly trying to trap Jesus. If we can get him to say the wrong thing, if we can get him to say something that will offend the Romans, if we can get him to say something that will drive away the popularity he has, because Jesus is more popular than me and that offends me. They're always trying to discredit Jesus. Who are you? Where do you come from? What are your credentials? Aren't you just a kid from Joseph and Mary? Aren't you the carpenter's son? What are you doing? Because of who the self-righteous Pharisees are and their self-righteous, self-absorbed agenda, they can't hear God. They can't see God working. They don't know who God is and what God is doing. They're literally blind, deaf, and lost. Which is why they're constantly bewildered and confused by Jesus. I'd like to say that's only a problem for the Pharisees. But I know that you and I, we struggle with being closed off to God. We're too distracted, we're too busy, we're too... And so we don't hear, we don't see, we don't know. Come on, we've had moments where we're blind, we're deaf, we're ignorant, we're distant from God. So flowing from this idea about the self-righteous Pharisees asking the wrong questions, let me lay down four actions for us. Four activities you can execute right now that will guard and protect you from being closed off to God. It's a preventative actions to prevent you from being blind, prevent you from being deaf, prevent you from being ignorant, prevent you from being distant from God. The first of these actions is to look for God's active hand around us. The first action, 
God is big, God is busy, and there are miracles and miraculous workings of God all around us. We could, we could line up people here to testify about God's miraculous working in their life. He's busy. We just get too distracted and too busy, so we are blind to it. When you are blind to the miraculous working of God in and around you, you have no reason to praise Him. The Pharisees had no reason to worship or praise God because they were blind. And if you and I will keep our antennas open and be looking for God's activity, we will see it. And we will see it all over the place. And God's miraculous working will surprise us because God will be working in and through people you wouldn't expect. God will be working in ways you didn't know. God will be working... And it'll encourage us, my friends. Don't be blind. Instead, be looking for God's active hand because he is a busy, busy guy around us. So that's the first action. The second action is to hear God's voice. The second action to guard and protect us from being blind, deaf, distant, and ignorant is to hear God's voice in his love letter to you. Read your Bible. Listen to your Bible on audio. Study your Bible. Listen to podcasts, YouTube videos, whatever, of preachers and teachers teaching and expounding the Bible. Have your ears open to what God has to say to you. I have been studying the Bible for oh, almost 40 years now. And I have looked at John chapter 8. 40, 50 times, maybe more. And yet, because I pray for God to speak to me through his written word, even though I've read this passage and read this passage and read this passage, God still has something special and something new to say pertaining exactly to what my present struggle and pain and difficulty is. But again, we struggle with this because we don't have time for that. And our worlds are so noisy. Quiet down and listen to the Creator because He's got something to say to you. Don't be deaf like the Pharisees. The third action to prevent, to guard against being closed off. It, every relationship requires effort. It doesn't matter how long you've been married. You better be working on your marriage. Divorce is expensive. It requires effort. So apply effort into your relationship with God. The steps toward having a healthy relationship in any relationship is time, talk, and trust. You spend time with your spouse, healthy relationship. You spend talking and listening to your spouse, healthy relationship. Men listening to your spouse you know, with the TV off. Wives don't talk to the husband when they're distracted by something more interesting. You know, it goes both ways. Time, talk, together, that grows trust. Trust, faithfulness grows in a marriage and it grows in our relationship with God. The problem is too many Baptists, so too many of us, are content being fat, fat babies having our souls saved and not wanting to grow anymore, and if God's not pushing us in the stroller, we're not going anywhere. we got to put the effort into that relationship so that relationship grows and is nurtured with God. We need to spend time with God. We need to be listening to God and talking to God in prayer. Our trust, our faith, our belief in Him needs to grow, my friends. Let's not be stuck like the Pharisees. And last but not least, fourth, we need to maintain that kind of effort. We need to maintain daily interaction. Daily interaction. Daily interaction prevents distance. So even if you've got a spouse, TDY, you need to find some way to interact. Send a text. Write a note. Whatever you need to do to have daily interaction. When it comes to God, God is here with you. He's not distant. He's right there. You don't have to go to him. 
So any day you don't interact with him, you are ignoring a house guest who is shadowing you all day long, and you're paying him no attention at all. We need to maintain daily interactions. Daily interactions in every kind of possible way. And that will prevent you from being distant. First phrase, where's your father? The Pharisees. Just showing how deaf, blind, ignorant, and distant they are. Let's go to the second phrase. The second phrase, John chapter 8, verse 19. You, this is Jesus now talking to them. It's his response. You know neither me nor my father. We make the mistake of thinking knowing God is some kind of facts. But it's not. The word knowing is not about facts and data. You may know the greatest quarterback in history, Love, and all his stats. You may know his stats. You may know his family. You may follow him on all your social media, but you don't actually know him. We get guilty of treating God like that. We want to know the facts. We want to know the data. We want our theology right. Not realizing that knowing God transcends data. It's having that personal relationship with him. It's about intimacy. You may know an awful lot of facts about sports figures, but you don't know them. You may know an awful lot of facts about celebrities, but you don't really know them. You don't have an intimate, passionate relationship with them, which is why the perfect image for that is a spouse. Husband, wife, children are the symbol to be worked out and enjoyed of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so to know Jesus, to know the Father, is to have an intimate and passionate relationship with God. Jesus is calling the Pharisees out on having no relationship with him. Now remember, the Pharisees have the Old Testament memorized. They can quote scripture, they can quote theology, they can quote, they've got all the head knowledge, but there's no heart connection. There's no love. There's no intimacy and passionate. They have rejected knowing Jesus. They have rejected knowing God. And that's a horrible, horrible thing to do. To reject a relationship of the Creator God reaching out to His creation. God loves us and wants to be part of our lives. And the Pharisees are giving God a cold shoulder walking past God and averting their eyes and pretending He's not there. They literally are the people lost in the darkness. And God is the light of the world and is offering light in the darkness. And they would rather stay in the dark, my friends, because they're comfortable with their blindness. They don't want to see how far off the path they are. And that is a warning to me that I have to make sure that in no way, at no moment, no time, no action, no choice, no word, no thought, do I reject Jesus. Instead, I want to do the well, I want to do the opposite. Instead of rejecting him, I want to embrace him. I want to know him in a more intimate and passionate way. So the application of this second phrase is to not be the Pharisees, but instead to know Jesus and to know him well. What do I mean when I say know Jesus? I mean two things. Know Jesus. Have an intimate and passionate relationship. You've got to accept the biblical Jesus in all of his complexity. That's what the Gospel of John is about. The Gospel of John is about who is Jesus. And we struggle with this because we like to nitpick the parts of Jesus we like, and we embrace and emphasize that, and we ignore the parts of Jesus we don't like. We put them in a little box, 
Jesus as Savior, Jesus as lover, and ignore all the rest. And the biblical Jesus is more complicated than that. He's Savior, and He has saved you and I from our sins. He is Lord, which also means boss, so He can tell us what to do. He's the prophet, priest, king. That's the meaning of the title Christ, Messiah. He's the judge. He's the creator. Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. He's logos, he's life, he's light. We've looked at the two I am statements we've covered so far, where Jesus said, I am the bread of life. We looked at that in depth. And then we just covered, I am the light of the world with the beginning of the new year. I am the light of the world. We need to accept Jesus for all of his complexity. In the same way, we got to accept people for all their complexity. It's a whole package, my friends. Know Jesus by accepting the biblical Jesus and not falling for some kind of culture, cult, worldly, Hollywood figure of Jesus. Talking about knowing Jesus, the second idea here is to embrace and experience that spiritual intimacy, that passionate relationship. It's not just enough to accept the complex biblical idea of Jesus, but Jesus is a person, and he wants to have an intimate and passionate relationship with you. He wants to have a spouse-like relationship with you, a BFF, best friends forever relationship with you. And so we need to embrace that. We need to experience that. We need to enjoy that. And that relationship is not an equal relationship. It's not a relationship between peers. He's superior to us. He's the boss. We're not. So it involves self-denial, which we don't like, but Scripture tells us to. It involves self-sacrifice. How can I sacrifice for Jesus? We don't like that. Scripture calls for that very loudly. It's about submission. A relationship with Jesus is about him being superior to us. It's unequal. He's the boss. We are not. And so we need to submit ourselves to him. Follow his lead. And of course, as big, strong Americans, we struggle with submitting to anything. Even a holy, holy God who loves us so much and wants to be part of our lives. The second phrase, know Jesus, please. Let's move to the third one. The third phrase comes from verse 19. Jesus is continuing to talk to the Pharisees. Jesus says, if you knew me, you would know my father also. You don't know me or my father, but if you knew me, you would also know my, my father. So knowing Jesus in an intimate and passionate relationship is tapping into knowing all of the Trinity, the triunity. To know Jesus is to know the Father, is to know the Holy Spirit. We have one God in three persons, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. One family, Father, Son, children, representing that kind of community. The Pharisees wanted to know where the Father was because they did not understand. And the Father is the planner, Jesus is the executioner, and the Holy Spirit is the applier. And our access to get to know and understand and have a relationship with the Father is in and through Jesus. And the Father loves you and I. He's in fact our adopted Father. And we're supposed to call out to Him, not in some formal term like we're looking to borrow money. Oh, oh Father dear, I've done my chores. Can I have 15 grand? You know, but we're supposed to go to the Father in intimacy. Daddy? Daddy? The scripture calls that Abba, Father. Abba is not the band from Sweden or whatever. Abba is for Daddy. 
It's the, it's the intimate call of a son, of a child to their father. So we pray to the Father in Jesus' name, and the Holy Spirit magnifies it, translates it. Prayer is, works the whole trinity, as it were. So we say, Daddy, I'm seeking. Daddy, I'm knocking. Daddy, I'm asking. And like a good heavenly father, he gives good gifts to his children. So when children ask for bread, he doesn't give us rocks or snakes. When you ask for vegetables, he gives you cheesecake. That's not in scripture, that's just my personal choice. Uh, you know, you know what I'm saying, right? Lord, deliver us from broccoli and give us more bacon. You know, something in there, right? We pray to the Heavenly Father, and like a good father, He gives to us. We pray in the name of Jesus. Jesus, our Savior. Jesus, our Lord. Our prophet, priest, and king. And the Holy Spirit lives in us, walks with us, translates what we pray to Daddy, because we often don't know. So he translates it, he interprets it. The Holy Spirit works in our lives. As believers in Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven in Jesus by his death and his blood. He fills us with the Holy Spirit and we are adopted, grafted into God the Father. So we are his adopted children, princes and princesses in the kingdom of God. And now that we have the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, in us, may the Holy Spirit fill us, convict us, guide and direct us. May the Holy Spirit empower you and I so that we can live in the Spirit and walk by the Spirit. And that's the command of our spiritual journey in the presence of God. You and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, are supposed to be living our lives, living in the Spirit, walking by the Spirit. And we refer to that, Galatians chapter 5, contrasting the fruits of the Spirit with the deeds of the flesh, Galatians chapter 5, huge chapter. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17, tells us to walk by the Spirit, my friends. So let's go there. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17 says this. But I say to you, walk, it's a command, walk, exclamation point, by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the desire of the flesh is against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another in order to keep you from doing whatever you want. Submission there. Spiritual warfare victory right there. Succeeding against temptation you've never succeeded against before. We often refer to walking in the Spirit and living in the Spirit without... Well, with, without making it practical. How do I walk by the Spirit? If it's a command to be obeyed, it involves temptation, it involves victory, it involves defeating the desires of the flesh, how do we do it? Let me give us six actions. Six actions for walking by the Spirit. All six actions are daily all six actions are daily commitments. This isn't one of those, on Monday I do number one, on Tuesday I do number two. I'm going to work on number one for this month, and then that not, you got to do all six. So they're all encompassing every single day. Six actions for walking in by the Spirit. The first action is downright depending on the Spirit. 
It's okay if we are needy. In this case, needy is good. We need to rely on the Spirit each day. We need to rely on the Spirit. We need to need Him more and more each day. That'll stretch your faith. That'll stretch your... So it's okay to depend on Him. He's there with you. That's why you can talk to Him. He will give you power. He will give you strength. He will give you... He's in the journey with you, my friends. We need to just every single day rely on Him. I need you, Holy Spirit. Second, we need to nurture that relationship. We need to nurture the relationship with God, which we've talked about. The Holy Spirit is crucial to that because the Father plans, Jesus executes the plan, and the Holy Spirit applies it. So the Holy Spirit is in the journey with us. So as we put in the effort to have an intimate and passionate relationship with God, it's the Holy Spirit that helps us. The Holy Spirit that cultivates that relationship that causes us to cherish it, that helps us develop it. The Holy Spirit is involved in it. So we have to prioritize daily nurturing that relationship. When we nurture a relationship with our holy creator God, we are in fact walking by the Spirit relationship. Number three, responding to the Spirit's prompting. The Spirit Spirit is active. The Spirit is busy. And the Spirit, will, the Spirit will speak to us, and we need to hear. The Spirit will prompt us to do something, and we need to obey. We need to act. The Spirit will have us react to something in a way that makes us uncomfortable, and we need to step out in faith and do it. The Holy Spirit will call us to action. Faith action that makes us uncomfortable. I can't start a conversation about Jesus with the checkout girl. I've never done that. Leave me alone. I don't want to do it. But, uh, and you need to say, sir, yes, sir. The Holy Spirit is prompting me. And say, oh, hi, Marcia. I'm on my way to church. Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? you got to listen to the Holy Spirit. Customer service. I like good customer service. Utah's good with good customer service. I like that about Utah. I had a customer service guy named Dustin who got stuck with me for 90 minutes. This whole thing is going to take about 90 minutes? Okay, Dustin. Where are you from? Oh, you're from Morgan. Oh, that's nice. I'm praying. I'm praying. I'm praying for Dustin. I'm praying for this conversation. He's in jail for 90 minutes with a preacher, right? I found out everything about Dustin's life. The Holy Spirit provided great opportunities for us to connect. The Holy Spirit provided great opportunities to plant seeds. I got to fully share the full gospel of Jesus Christ with him and ask him to pray to accept Jesus Christ all within 90 minutes of customer service. Holy Spirit prompting. That's all it is. Okay, I, I, this, I'm uncomfortable. I'll do it. Hi, Dustin. Let's talk about you. Hi, Dustin. Let's talk about you. Hi, Dustin. Let's talk about you and Jesus. Pray for Dustin. We need to respond to the Spirit's prompting because the Spirit will often prompt us to do something we would never think of, stepping out in faith. Number four, bearing the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit are not actions, they are results. They aren't things to do, they are evidence of you walking in the Spirit. If you walk in the Spirit, these fruits will grow in your life. You know, things like joy and love, peace and patience, kindness and goodness, integrity, gentleness and self-control. These are characteristics and evidence of walking in the Spirit. Don't you want this kind of character? Don't you want this kind of character in the people around you? Don't you want your family to have this kind of character? Wouldn't society be a much better place 
If everybody demonstrated evidence of character that was love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Evidence. So we need to be bearing the fruit of this evidence. Realizing it is often painful. Fruit grows where there is sunshine. Even at 113 degrees. It's when it's raining and storming, you get the water. The nutrients in the soil literally come from death. Bears fruit. Number four. Let's bear the fruit, my friends. Number five. Five of the six actions for walking in the Spirit. Number five. Confessing your sins. We need to keep our account with God short. Proverbs 28, verse 13. He who confesses and forsakes his sin will find mercy, will find compassion. So let's confess our sin. Jesus has already forgiven you. You ain't telling on yourself. He already knows. <laughs> when you confess your sin, it's about you and your healing from your wickedness. Because sin is self-destructive. And forsaking is something we don't talk enough about. You cannot confess a sin on your way to do it. I, I know you've done it. I've done it, right? Lord, forgive me for what I'm about to do. That is not repentance or confession in any kind of way. The definition is forsaking. And forsaking is the hard part, my friends. Forsa forsaking means leaving it behind. You set it down, you walk away, you forget where it was. So when you confess a sin, you also have to forsake it. Set it down, walk away, forget where it was. And walk in that kind of victory, my friends. When we confess, when we forsake, we are walking by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is holy, and we struggle with holy. And so he works on us. Ah, the sixth one. Six actions for walking by the Spirit. This is the hardest one of all. It's the hardest one for me. It's the hardest one for you, I know. And that is surrendering to God's will. He's the boss. We are not. He's the king. We're the subjects. He says, do. We say, sir, yes, sir. He says, don't do it, and we flee from it. It's all about yielding ourselves to him, submitting ourselves to him, the creation following the creator. It's tough. It's hard. But that's walking in the spirit. Denying ourself magnifies him. Self-sacrifice connects us with Jesus' sacrifice and and makes us a brighter light to a dark world. We get in trouble. Huh? We get in trouble when we buck this, right? When we're the stubborn, rebellious child of God. And then we are in hot water and pray for rescuing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've, we've all done it. Six actions for, uh, for walking by the Spirit, my friends. Ended with the hardest one. Surrendering to God's will, His plan, His method. His timing, oh, that one gets me every time. Because his timetable is like a thousand times slower than mine. You, you know, you know. The fourth phrase is really just verse 20. Jesus spoke and taught openly because no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Here's what Jesus is saying in this verse. Knowing God in an intimate and passionate relationship, walking in the Spirit transforms our lives. It transforms the way that we live so that we are living differently. Jesus could teach and preach in the open knowing they could not seize him because it was not the Father's will for it to happen yet. And when you walk in the Spirit, when you have an intimate and passionate relationship with God, you have a clear understanding of God's will, God's plan, and God's method. And that leads to greater confidence and a greater understanding for you to be able to boldly go where no one has gone before. 
knowing leads to understanding God's will. God's will. God's will is not some vague, wibbly-wobbly, unknown, timey-wimey stuff. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, in the Lord's Prayer, it talks about God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven. His will, his plan, his method, his timing. I know, the last one, I, I so struggle with that one. But I do not need testing in patience, Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, lays it out clearly if you're ever wondering what God's will is. What is God's will for you? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 says, For God's will is, it can't get much clearer than that, right? For God's will is your sanctification. Sanctification, that's a big Bible word for being like Jesus. So it's God's will for you and I to be like Jesus selflessly and sacrificially loving God, selflessly and sacrificially loving people, growing in holiness, godliness, innocence, and purity, my friends. And then Romans 12, verse 2. Romans 12, verse 1 is about being a living sacrifice, an act of worship. But verse 12, verse 2 talks about when we do that, when our minds are transformed, then we prove what the will of God is. We give evidence to what the will of God is, and it has three descriptors. God's will, God's method, God's timing is good, acceptable, and perfect. Even, even his timing is perfect. I'm talking to myself. Yes, Lord. Good, acceptable, and perfect. Knowing God, having an intimate and passionate relationship with God, leads you to understand this stuff so that you understand God's will done here. You understand God's will for us to be holy and innocent, that God's will is good, acceptable, and perfect in our lives, in the good days and in the bad days. Knowing God in an intimate and passionate way leads to confidence. A believer in Jesus Christ who knows God is walking by the Spirit, knows that I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. So if God asks me to have an awkward conversation with somebody, I know God's in the midst of it. The Holy Spirit will give me the words to say it will not be awkward. It will be worth the time. God can cause all things. We often, we often get caught up on our own insecurities, our own shortcomings, our own weaknesses, past failures. And and we think that that makes us less. Not realizing that everything we actually do, our entire life, is not about us, but about God. And because it's about God, it's not about any of that baggage and garbage. But it's 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. God did not give us a spirit of timidity, quiet, shy, weakness. But instead, he gave us a spirit of power, love, and self-control. You and I, my friends, we are walking in victory, and we have the Holy Spirit in us working in a powerful way. So let's start acting in power, behaving in love, and living our lives in self-control. And let his light shine in and through us, my friends. When you know God and when you walk in the Spirit, fear decreases. Faith increases. Fear diminishes. Faith rises. Faith falls. Uh, Faith falls. (laughs) Fear falls. Faith increases. I knew I was going to mess that up. I messed it up every time I practiced this, but I only messed it up one time before you guys. That's the best record yet. All right. Look at Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Isaiah 41, 10 says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will also help you. 
I will also uphold you with my righteous right hand. What can stand against that? Nothing. Let's do it. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, which is a much shorter verse. For we walk by faith, not by sight. God's got this, so we can do it. We can be the men and women of faith that we're supposed to be. And when we do that, our lives are transformed. Our lifestyle is transformed. And the world shakes because the followers of Jesus Christ are living lives that give him honor and glory. Do you know Jesus in an intimate and passionate relationship? Are you living a lifestyle, a faith lifestyle, with less fear and increased trust? The Holy Spirit will answer that question for you. These are things we need to talk about at lunch, on the drive home, sitting on the couch. Let's talk about this. Faith lifestyle. Less fear. Increased trust, my friends.